Good morning, good afternoon, or good evening, depending on where you are in the world, and welcome to today's Plastic Today webinar, Polymer Characterization with Dynamic Mechanical Analysis, or DMA, sponsored by Perkin Elmer and broadcast by Informa. I am Michael Krieger. I will be your moderator today. We have just a few announcements before we begin. This webinar is designed to be interactive. The dock of widgets at the bottom of your screen will allow you to learn about today's speaker, download resources, share this webinar via social media outlets, and participate in the Q&A session that takes place at the end of our presentation. Slides will advance automatically throughout the event. You may also download a copy of the slides via the resources widget. Toward the end of our webinar, we'll ask you to complete our survey found on the right-hand side of your screen. Please take a moment to fill this out before leaving us today, as your feedback will provide us with valuable information on how we can improve future events. Lastly, or if you're experiencing any technical problems, please click the Help widget found at the bottom of your screen, or type your issue into the Q&A area, and we'll be glad to offer one-on-one. -on -one. Now, on to the presentation, Polymer Characterization with Dynamic Mechanical Analysis, discussing today's topic is Dr. Jun Wang. He is the Senior Field Application Scientist at Perkin Elmer for Thermal and Elemental Analysis. He has a PhD in Chemistry from the University of Utah and has over 20 years of experience in thermal analysis and a variety of other analytical techniques. Dr. Wang joined Perkin Elmer in 2008 and is based in California. He has numerous peer-reviewed publications and technical notes Dr. Wang, over to you. Hi, everyone. My name is Jun Wang. I'm an application scientist at Perkin Elmer. In this presentation, I'll be discussing the theories and applications of DMA for polymer characterization. I will start with some review of the mechanical properties of polymer measured by a traditional tester and explain the so-called stress strain curve. Then discuss the basics of dynamic mechanical analysis uh, and uh, one of the cool capabilities, TTS, time temperature superposition, uh, followed by some test environment uh, that can be added to DMA tests for in-service study. And after that, quickly mention some of the non-dynamic analysis they can do with the DMA, namely the static or transient methods. And at the end of the talk, I will try to provide some guidance on how to choose the right method for your material. And of course, uh, lots of examples of applications will be demonstrated between these topics. We all know that material characterization is essential because it greatly helps us um, understand the relationship between molecular structure, processing conditions, material properties, and eventually the product performance. We are also relying on all sorts of analytical tools for failure analysis, formulation, and reverse engineering. And mechanical testing plays a very important role in these applications. The most basic mechanical test is applying a force to a sample and measure the deformation of the sample. For example, in this tensile test, the sample has initial length of L0, and the area is the cross-section area of the sample. When, the, when a force is, is added to the sample, and the resulting length increases to L. Now we can define two most useful terms in mechanical tests. Stress is the ratio of the force to area. It has the same unit as pressure on Pascal's. Strain is the length difference divided by the initial length, and it's unitless. When you perform a strain scan, um, you get a typical stress curve, a stress strain curve like this on the right-hand side. Uh, polymers usually give a linear response when the strain is small, and Young's modulus, Young's modulus can be calculated using the slope of this linear region. The range of this linear region depends on how close the polymer is to an ideal elastomer. Most materials are not ideal, so you can see a small um, curvature even in the linear region, so sometimes it's difficult to determine the Young's modulus. 
the curvature becomes more pronounced as the stress increases the uh, increases and uh, the material deforms when the curve um, enters a nonlinear region. This is caused by knacking of the specimen and uh, its subsequent drawing out. It's also caused uh, softening or cold drawing. The maximum uh, stress before the softening um, uh, is defined as a yield point, where you can get yield stress and yield strain. At, uh, at the yield stress, main chain segmental motion is initiated and parts of the chains can move past each other. Um, as you keep increasing the stress, the material starts to harden again to eventual breaking. Uh, this is the failure point. Ultimate strength can be determined. The area under the curve is the energy required to break the material. Um, of course, polymer behave very differently um, at very different temperatures. So when you perform the same test at other temperatures, the stress strain curve can be completely different. Polymers are much more brittle at low uh, temperatures, demonstrating high modulus and breaks at lower strains. When the polymers are heated to above the TM, the melting temperature, especially for thermoplastics, the material starts to behave like liquid. There are many factors that change the look of the stress strain curve. Here are some of them. If we are looking at only the linear region, the slope or Young's modulus increases as we increase the cross-link density or, cross or crystallinity or realign the sample so more linear molecules are in the same direction of testing. Modulus can also be increased by adding fillers or decreased by adding plasticizers. Even for the same material, the parent um, modulus goes up as you scan the stress or strain more rapidly. Lastly, we already know the temperature is a big factor, but if you want to, um, if you have to uh, construct a temperature dependent modulus with a classic mechanical texture, you have to run the sample at a series of temperatures and plot them out point by point. Now we are moving on to DMA, which eliminates this hassle of uh, time-consuming procedure. How does the DMA work? Well, the classic mechanical testers can scan the stress or strain to generate a full um, stress strain curve. And DMA applies a small oscillating force to the material and the result in the deformation is measured by a LVDT or optically with nanometer sensitivity. Using a Perkin Elmer DMA 8000 as an example, the force motor labeled as shaker gen generates a, a sinusoidal wave and, it is, and this is transmitted to the sample via a drive shaft with the user defined frequency typically from 0.001 hertz to 1000 hertz. The displacement of the sample, called a red, is measured by a LVDT in the middle of the schematic diagram. During the te test, sample can be heated or cooled from liquid nitrogen temperature all the way up to 600 degrees C. The green arrows on the bottom left show the small stream amplitude. Uh, above, above zero or around zero, depending on how the sample is tested. This is done in a string control mode. Uh, the purple uh, arrows show oscillating stress used in the test. This is the other mode called stress control mode. In string control mode, displacement amplitude is fixed, and the resulting stress of the sample is measured by implementing a force balance transducer. In stress control mode, a set maximum force is applied to the, sam to the sample. Both modes require the sample being tested in the linear range of the string stress, stress string curve. The amplitude has to be small because sample may creep or soften as the sample go, uh, temperature go up, the linear range uh, and uh, the linear range will narrow. But we want to keep, uh, we want to make sure uh, to stay in the linear region as long as possible. 
Here are the details how stress and strain measured with the DMA. When a periodic force is applied to a sample, uh, which is the blue curve, the sample will respond in green curve, but usually with a delay. The amplitude of the force and the sample displacement used together with the sample geometry data um, to calculate a complex modulus, which is the stress amplitude divided by the string amplitude. This, by concept, is different from the Young's modulus, which is a slope of the whole linear region of the stress string curve. DMA for every data point is only using one point on that curve in the linear region. This delay is um, called phase shift of delta or delta. Um, all polymers are viscoelastic. Uh, meaning they behave like elastic, elastic solid and a viscous fluid uh, at the same time. Delta would be zero for ideal solid, uh, such as a coil spring. The energy stored can be recovered completely by releasing the stress. A perfect liquid, however, would lead to a 90 degree phase shift, like water or glycerin. It will not restore to its original geometry once deformed, the energy is 100% lost and dissipated via molecule motion and friction. Polymer is somewhere in the between. So the complex modulus is expressed in two components, real component and imaginary component. The real component E prime or G prime if the sample is measured in shear model and shear mode um, is called storage modulus. It represents the recoverable energy of the elastic component. The imaginary component E double prime is called the loss modulus, which carries the information on the viscous behavior. The ratio of the loss to the storage is the 10 delta, and often called damping. It is a measure of the energy dissipation of a material. Now we start to see the differences between classic a mechanical tester and a DMA. A classic tester can produce very high force. They can generate a full stress string curve, give you Young's modulus if done in pencil mode, but work primarily outside the linear region for the measurement of yield and, and uh, ultimate strength, etc. A DMA, however, uses a small, uh, smaller force and works primarily in the linear region making it more sensitive to materials, molecular structure, and chemistry-related properties. It allows you to separate elastic and viscous components of a polymer. This is often desired because it's the viscous component that's determining the material properties, such as impact resistance and damping. You can also observe a material under a wide range of temperatures, scan rates, and the frequencies as well. And it's also easier to apply different test conditions, such as controlled relative humidity, UV radiation, solvents, etc., to mimic an in-service behavior. Last but not least, the MAs are usually they usually have a smaller uh, footprint. Sometimes can be as small as a, a desktop computer. Uh, this shows you the possible transitions one can get from DMA temperature scan. Uh, this graph is only showing the storage modulus. Most of the times, we'll first look at the TG. It shows a significant um, modulus drop as a result of gradual main chain movement. In other words, material softening. Of course, for purely crystalline materials, no TG occurs because TG is from the amorphous content. Following the TG is the melting drop of um, of modulus. This doesn't appear, uh, of course, if a thermostat is tested. Sometimes there is a short increase of modulus before melting. That could be the cold crystallization or residual pure. DMA is at least 10 times more sensitive than DSC and other techniques. So oftentimes you see other weak transitions occurring below TG. These transitions indicate solar changes in the material due to local motions of the polymer molecules. 
and these transitions often uh, correlate with mechanical properties such as toughness. DMA allow low starting temperatures from liquid nitrogen temperature in the standard furnace or in a submerging liquid bath. So this allows, allows you to uh, easily look for these small molecular motions. Uh, other additional transitions can also be observed in the rubbery plateau such as crystal crystal slip. Adding the loss factor 10 delta to the curve, for each transition there is usually a peak around the modulus drop. With this, uh, five regions of the viscoelastic behavior can be identified by the DMA. Glass, rubbery, liquid flow, and two narrow intermediate regions between them. The value reported as a TG varies with industry. Uh, the common methods used are the onset of the um, uh, modulus drop, um, the peak of the 10 delta and the peak of the uh, loss modulus curve, E double prime. The TG is also a function of frequency, typically 1 Hz is used, but there, there can be any other frequencies. Um, there are several other techniques often used to, to measure TG, soft mean temperature or other similar terms. The measurements are usually different, sometimes over 20 degrees uh, difference because different physical properties change, uh, changes are measured and these properties do not change at the, at the exact same temperature range. DMA is much more sensitive to TG than, than other thermal analysis techniques, making it a better tool for challenging polymers uh, with high crystallinity, broad TG uh, polymer blends or thin films. So um, now I have a material. How do I test it? What geometry and how big or small the sample needs to be? The choice of ge geometry you run your sample is uh, dictated by the sample's physical state at the beginning of the, the experiment uh, and its difficulty in loading and the experiment, experiment you want to run. Uh, there are several different fixtures for you to choose from. For example, if the sample is a thin film or fiber um, with moderate um, modulus, the best choice is to use a tension geometry. The sample is clamped one end to a fixed clamp and the other end to the drive shaft clamp. Um, a stiff bar of polymer can be running all of the flexure um, fixtures, but single cantilever is often used because it is simple to load and allows thermal expansion of the specimen. Dual cantilever bending is best for highly oriented uh, samples that are likely to retract above TG. Um, both ends are fixed. Three-point bending is used for accurate modulus values for very stiff, high modulus materials, like composite materials, because the sample bar is placed on two knife edges and the force is applied by the center knife. There is no clamping effect. However, it is best to not run above the TG because it is not supported by any clamps when it softens. Uncured um, thermosets are often run in shear mode. It's axial, not torsional, as in a rheometer. Um, other soft materials can also be tested to shear modules. Uh, compression mode is good for um, irregularly shaped samples or other difficult to mount samples with two, uh, with uh, um, low to moderate uh, modulus. For more challenging types of samples, you can also try the following approaches. Material pocket is made from stainless steel, flat or mesh. Uh, they are designed for holding powders and soft, uh, soft samples that cannot support their own weight. The pocket is scored uh, lengthways to allow it to be folded in half, crimped, and clamped into the DMA.
in a single cantilever bending mode. Uh, this is an example using the material pocket to run small graded polystyrene pieces and how the results compare to a uh, polystyrene bar. It is clear that the glass transition shown as a peak in the 10 delta data is the same for both experiments. The peak value is less for the material pocket but this is a reflection of lower sample mass and effective dilution of the signal by the stiffness of the material pocket. Other materials may also be used as a substrate for viscous samples such as wire mesh, a gauze tape, or a, a strip cut from a business card. In this example, a bar of PMMA was clamped in the single cantilever bending clamps and cooled from uh, cooled with liquid nitrogen to negative 25 degrees. The experiment collected data at all frequencies during the same experiment. A clear class transition is observed between 100 C and 150 C on the 10 delta peaks. Peak temperature has strong frequency dependence. This is true for all relaxations, usually not so for crystallization, curing, or volatile evaporation. So they have, this helps to identify transitions. When we expand um, the part of the curve from negative 40 C to 80 degrees C, it is clear that a beta transition is visible. Again, this is frequency dependent as, it, as expected for a relaxation event. Then the Arrhenius equation can be used to calculate the activation energy for these relaxations. A plot of log frequency against uh, 1 over temperature is known as uh, a Arrhenius plot. The activation energy for the beta uh, relaxation of PMMA is calculated to be 65 kilojoules uh, per mole. Uh, and for the glass transition, it is 368 kilojoules per mole. Both lines show excellent fit parameters. This is a test of a composite material. It's suspected that it's not fully cured, as claimed. As you can see, the Tg from the modulus onset is lower than specs, and uh, two split peak in the 10 delta curve confirms that this is not fully cured material. This is some interesting work published in a book, Conservation of Modern Oil Paintings. Uh, this chapter specifically discussed the use of DMA for the characterization of commercial artists' oil paint. For better understanding of the paint properties relevant to paint formulation, and conservation of oil paintings. Paint is a complex mixture of many kinds of polymers. Its mechanical properties um, are a function of degree of drying, uh, curing, subsequent aging, and pigments used. All the ingredients have effects on how to use, store, or clean the paintings. They, paint, they painted the oil samples on polyester film dried and used in the single cantilever bending for the glass transition measurement. It was found that different pure paint have very different glass transitions, and it is affected by various conditions. This greatly helped the understanding of op um, optimum usage of the paints and the conservation procedures. Laminated EVA is commonly used for solar module encapsulation. The degree of cross-linking is critical for performance, but typically determined quantitatively by gel fraction test, which is a solvent extraction method. In this work, uh, simulated module laminated samples were used. There are two disks. Each disk has two layers of EVA encapsulant and a layer of TP backsheet. They were tested in shear mode on the DMA 8000 and the shear moduli are compared to the gel content. It was demonstrated that a very good fit using the full swelling expression 
allowing for determining uh, the degree of cross-linking in EVA solar module encapsulation with this new non-destructive method. We have looked at the frequency dependence of a polymer by running a sample with multiple frequencies during a temperature scan, thanks to the modern DMAs that allow this to be done in a single experiment. Another approach is to scan the whole frequency range at a series of constant temperatures. Um, there are many purposes of doing this, but that we won't have time to discuss it today. We know the modulus is a function of frequency. A material exhibits more elastic-like behavior as, a, as the testing frequency increases, and the storage modulus tends to slope upward toward higher frequency. If one can generate a modulus scan over a wide enough frequency range, the plot of the storage modulus versus frequency appears like a reverse of a temperature scan. In other words, by changing the frequency, you can move a material through a transition. The same time temperature equivalence also applies to modulus as well as um, compliance, 10 delta, and other properties. This lays out the uh, theory foundation for time temperature superposition. Sometimes there is a problem with frequency scans. We are limited to the frequency range of a DMA usually between 0.01 Hz and 1000 Hz. Uh, based on the time temperature equivalence idea we discussed in the previous slide, we can use some mathematical model to predict material behavior at much higher or lower, lower frequencies. This is the basis um, for time temperature superposition, or TTS. Modeled data from DMA using TTS can give indication of long-term behavior in a very short time. Similarly, higher frequency uh, applications, uh, for example, airbag liner impact um, can have a frequency very close to 10,000 degrees. And these high frequency uh, applications can be investigated quickly and easily using the DMA. The data required for TTS is collected using a series of frequency scans collected at isothermal temperatures in a range which passes across the glass transition of the material being tested. When correctly chosen, the start temperature and temperature and the temperature steps, um, uh, a set of data called frequency dispersion will be obtained. And an example taken from a rubber sample in tension mode is shown on the right. The frequency ranges from uh, 0.01 Hz to 100 Hz, scanned from negative 80 degrees C to 30 degrees C at 10 degrees C increment. Storage moduli are plotted against the frequency for each temperature. Low temperatures curve are on top, high, high, high temperature, uh, low modulus curves are lower in the graph. The next step is to generate a master curve. This is usually done automatically with the software, but here's how it works. First, a reference temperature is selected, typically in the center of the TG. Um, here it is negative 30 degrees C, but it's not the only choice. Then the other curves are shifted around the reference temperature curve. First curve below it, uh, negative 20 C, uh, shift to the left to align with the reference. After the shift, the shift factor AT for this temperature, um, uh, AT is the, um, the shift factor is the frequency difference between before and after the shift. And that is recorded in a table. Then um, we move on to the next temperature, negative 40 degrees C. We'll shift that to the right. Then the shift factor for uh, minus 40 degrees C um, is entered into the table. 
At the end, when all curves are shifted to produce a new continuous modulus curve versus frequency, this fully superimposed new curve is called the master curve. The frequency range now is expanded to cover from uh, 10 to negative 11th hertz to 10 to the 16th hertz. The storage modulus data shows a relatively flat response to frequency from uh, 1 MHz and up on the uh, top right corner, in the sense that the modulus does not appear to change a lot uh, on this logarithm scale within this frequency range. At these frequencies, uh, it suggests that the material does not significantly risk fracturing and the material might have reasonable impact properties over a wide range of frequencies. And all the shift factors uh, for the temperatures are entered into the table. 10 delta curve and loss modulus curves can also be shifted together with the storage modulus to generate individual master curves. Uh, the 10 delta master curve is shown here. If the 10 delta curve master curve does not make a continuous curve, it will suggest that the data fit might not be good enough for the time temperature superposition modeling. The shift factors of a master curve have some relationship with the temperature. Generally, the uh, Arrhenius equation is, is acknowledged with reasonably good accuracy to determine the shift factors. Here, Ea, the activation energy, for the change, uh, it, it usually it means uh, the change in viscosity. Um, it's also called the flow activation energy. Uh, R is the gas constant, and Tr is the reference temperature in Kelvin. Uh, how um, how does it work? Um, so if the Arrhenius equation is valid, that is when you plot a logarithm of the empirically determined shift factor values uh, log AT versus the reciprocal absolute temperature, uh, I will produce a straight line. The activation, then the activation energy can be calculated. With this activation energy and the reference temperature, one can calculate the shift factor for any desired temperature, in addition to the temperatures already tested. Um, as the activation energy values depend on the molecular um, parameters of the molecule of, of the polymers, uh, they can be used as a probe of changes um, in polymer structure. For example, changes in molar ratio of uh, serious copolymers will have a corresponding change in the activation energy. If we think of the uh, Rhenius equation as a single parameter model, a more popular numerical model is the two-parameter WLF model. It was developed by Williams, Landau, and Ferry in 1955. The WLF function is given here. C1 and C2 are material constants. They are found to be similar for many amorphous polymers with C1 uh, being 17.44 and C2 51.6 in a temperature range between Tg and Tg plus, minus, plus 100 degrees C. C1 may be identified as relating to free uh, to, to uh, fractional free volume. It increases with the reduction of free volume of the base polymer by adding small molecule modifiers. As one can see from the equation, Tg serves as a corresponding state for viscoelastic behavior. So that's why we usually pick Tg, or more precisely, the, in, the inflection point in the, in the modulus curve at Tg to be the uh, reference temperature. A plot of log AT um, versus T is drawn here. So it shows very good fit uh, with C1 and C, C2 determined, uh, we'll be able to calculate the shift factor for any temperature. A third approach is the numerical fit of the master curve itself. Um, 
to produce a master curve equation representing the modulus as a function of frequency. Many sigmoidal type of functions have been studied. A generalized logistic non-symmetric sigmoid was found to provide very good fit for asphalt materials. Master curves and TTS can be a very useful tool for engineers and scientists. However, it should be stressed that TTS is a modeling technique and the results may be incorrect, misleading, or wildly inaccurate in the worst cases. It is up to the scientist carrying out the measurements to make an assessment of the, of the uh, validity of the data, and this will usually involve a correction with other forms of measurement. I will show one method later um, to assess data in the next slide. A full treatment of the technique and its theory is outside the scope of this talk. This is a published work showing the application of TTS for cross-linked polymer. The wicked plot is one of the commonly used methods to assess whether the data are suitable for analysis using the empirical WLF relationship. It simply plots 10 delta versus storage modulus. If the curve is almost entirely symmetrical and there is no anomaly, like the curve in this wicked plot in the middle, it is possible uh, to apply the principle of time temperature superposition. The master curve is shown on the right. The values of C1 and C2 were determined as uh, 17.4 and 51.6 respectively. And that, that's exactly the values to represent standard values for uh, polymers in general. The theta of the storage modulus do not seem to change significantly. Also on this uh, um, log uh, scale, um, Y scale, in the frequency range between 100 hertz and 10 megahertz. So also suggesting that this material does not uh, significantly risk fracturing at higher frequencies. As we discussed earlier, the mechanical properties of a polymer can change significantly when tested in a different environment. So it's important that we can test the material with similar conditions as in service environment. There are some common accessories that can be easily used with a DMA. A humidity generator can produce an environment with controlled relative humidity at a constant temperature or during heating ramp. Um, since moisture is a plasticizer for a lot of polymers, the mechanical properties can be measured with controlled relative humidity. A fluid bath is for testing samples immersed in the liquid, which can be water, solvents, oil, lubricants, etc. This is required test conditions for some medical devices and the materials used in liquid or uh, outdoors. A UV source provides UV radiation with a light guide. Uh, so degradation UV curing can be analyzed in a DMA. This slide shows you uh, two nylon fibers um, are tested in the tension mode on um, top left uh, with one in dry condition and the other in near saturated um, humidity. The glass transition temperature of both samples is shown as a peak in the 10 delta. Humidity acts to plasticize the material and has reduced the Tg by nearly 40 degrees C. Nylon 6 can absorb a surprising amount of water, up to 10%. So the practical effect of these findings is that once the polymer is at or above its glass transition temperature, it will tend to creep when any load is applied and moisture can significantly increase that creep tendency. 
Uh, the, the bottom uh, application is about gelatin. Gelatin is commonly used in both foods and pharmaceuticals. This figure shows the response from DMA as a function of time. As a piece of gelatin is tested in water at two different temperatures, in both samples, the modulus decreases with time after immersion reflecting the sample getting less stiff as it dissolves. Eventually, the sample disintegrates uh, the rate of softening and the time taken to destroy the sample were both faster at 30 degrees C, at 38 degrees C than the 25 degrees C. The 10 delta is often referred to as dampening as a damping factor and it can indicate the sample becoming less elastic and more viscous if 10 delta increases. The end point of both experiments show this behavior as expected. The sample is no longer a self-supporting solid but rather a viscous semi-solid which would display more viscous characteristics. The 38 degree C data in, in red dotted line shows a broad peak indicates swell, uh, swelling of the material as a prelude to this dissolution. Electron spun fibrous mats are popular in bioengineering. When used in the field of tissue engineering and controlled drug delivery, it's much desired to be strong, porous, and easy to degrade. In this work done at UCLA, blends of hydrophobic PCL and hydrophilic PGA PCL PGA triblock copolymer were electron spun into aligned fibrous mats to assess the copolymer's mechanical and degradative properties. Samples are tested in tension mode in a 37 degrees C fluid bath with PBS. They were able to relate modulus reduction rate uh, to the ratio of the two uh, components. Um, this slide shows how DMA with a UV accessory is used to study the distortion of polymer during curing process. Acrylic resin samples were uh, prepared by coating the material on the paper backing and uh, then running a single cantilever geometry. When the UV is turned on and the photo curing begins, distortion of the sample was measured in the DMA by tracking the static position of the probe. As you can see from the right graph, uh, the light is turned on at five minutes. The purple curve increases, that's the, the um, uh, probe displacement due to the distortion of the sample uh, being cured on the paper backing. Uh, so this new project, uh, this uh, this project uh, also involves the use of UVDSC and the UVTMA. So uh, together with the UVDMA, so all these techniques allows uh, make it possible to find which parameter, uh, UV intensity, temperature, exposure time, etc., which parameter had uh, the greatest effect on the curing of acrylic resins. And this can greatly help optimize the curing process. DMA can also be used without applying the oscillating dynamic force. Um, these methods include creep recovery, uh, stress relaxation, and the coefficient of thermal expansion. Um, uh, so let me use just one slide to briefly touch upon these methods. In creep, uh, stress is applied to the sample and held constant while deformation is measured versus time. Uh, after some time, the stress is removed and the recovery is measured. As you can see from the right graph, um, the blue curve is the constant stress uh, added to a sample and then removed later. Uh, the red curve is the material deformation in, in the first transition zone, uh, followed by recovery zone. Uh, 
at the end of the recovery, percentage of unrecover is obtained. Uh, you can do this in many cycles um, um, at room temperature or um, as you increase the temperature. Uh, creep recovery test allows us to study the effect of long time uh, stress loads, fatigue, ability to return to original shape, and a degree of permanent deformation. Uh, the second is uh, stress relaxation. Uh, deformation is applied to the sample and held constant. And the, de uh, and the degradation of the stress required to maintain the deformation is measured versus time. So different in, than creep, this time we, uh, we hold the deformation and uh, monitor the change of the stress. Another test is CTE. Uh, little or no force is applied to a sample. The probe position is measured uh, to determine the coefficient of linear thermal expansion as it's being heated. It, uh, it is also a method to, uh, to measure Tg because the, the CTE before and after Tg of a polymer are different. These methods will be discussed in, the, in detail, uh, maybe in a future webinar on TMA. Um, after all these information and application we just covered, uh, what type of test do I choose? You may wonder. And there are tons of standard methods, including the ASTM methods you can choose from. So the test needs to be needs to reflect the type of stress the material will see, the frequency at which this is applied, the level of stress and strain, and the sample environment. Here are uh, some of the most uh, um, used tests listed in the table. You can start from the last column, uh, what it tells you. You can start from this column and find the goals of your tests. Uh, this table and um, some other material are taken from Kevin Menard's book, Dynamic Mechanical Analysis, 3rd edition. Uh, this is a great book, great resource for DMA analysis. Uh, this table also summarizes today's topic. Uh, DMA is a state-of-the-art technique. When you have learned how to use it, it's a wonderful tool for the characterization of the mechanical properties of a wild range of materials. And this concludes my presentation today. For more information, please visit uh, Perkyomer Thermal Analysis website or contact me directly uh, with uh, the email address listed here. Thank you for your attention. Thank you, Dr. Wang, for that presentation. Now on to the Q&A portion of our event. As a reminder to participate in the Q&A, just type your question into the text box located to the right of the presentation window or click on the Q&A icon at the bottom of your screen. If we're not able to answer all submitted questions during today's webinar, we'll be sure to share them with our speaker who can reply to you offline. So let's get right to it. First question comes from Benetria, who wants to know, when setting up your temperature and frequency scan in Pyrus, how do you determine which frequency to analyze your sample? Uh, can you hear me OK? Yes. OK. Yeah, so um, um, there are two scenarios. I'm, I'm not sure which um, uh, the scenario you're asking about. If you are just setting up a temperature scan and want to do multiple frequency, uh, with that, to, to measure modulus in 10 delta, uh, of course, you want to start a temperature below at least 20, 30 minutes below, uh, degrees below the glass transition. And uh, I would normally use two frequencies, 1 hertz and 10 hertz, because 1 hertz is everybody used to report the TG and 10 delta. And 10 hertz gives me higher frequency data, so you can compare them, because a lot of it, uh, for example, peaks in a 10 delta curve, on the 10 delta curve, uh, you are not sure if it's a relaxation or if it's a re evaporation of water, moisture, 
um, as the uh, relaxation will, uh, relaxation um, is dependent on the frequency, but uh, evaporation and uh, crystallization and other um, transitions is not so dependent on the frequency. So you can tell by comparing the two frequencies. Or if you're talking about how to set up a, a time temperature superposition scan, then um, we usually recommend you run a, a single temperature scan first to find the TG. So because we want to uh, start um, our temperature below the TG and the finish above the TG in the TTS setup. And the frequency range, we really recommend that you cover a wide range, at least three decades of um, frequency. And um, we want to have more um, temperatures, isothermal temperatures between the start and the end. OK, great. Thanks for that. This question comes from Eduardo, who wants to know, for determining the stress, we have to use the applied force, but one of my outputs is a dynamic force and static force. Which one should we use for stress determination? Well, it depends. I mean, if you are just um, uh, wanted to do, want to get an average stress, then you want to use the static force. Um, because that's the, the force is oscillating around that, uh, but the, the actual force is the sum um, of the static and the dynamic to the sample. So the software used the sum of the two to calculate the complex modulus, and I use the phase shift to calculate um, to separate uh, the uh, start modulus and um, loss modulus. Terrific. Thanks for that. Keep the questions coming. This one comes from Sam, who wants to know, how do you run a three-point bending in a fluid bath? Well, it's actually hard to run a three-point bending in a fluid bath. Um, I think some of the audience may also wonder, how is it even possible for any geometry uh, for immersion tests? Because uh, a lot of pictures are showing you the uh, setup is above the um, LEDT and motor, so it's on the top. How do you submerge sample in a in a in a, in a liquid? Actually, this is one of the really nice uh, capabilities we, we have with uh, the Perkyomer DMA 8000 because it has a rotating analy analysis head, so you can rotate that to vertical up, horizontal, or vertical down. So when you turn head down, then you can actually mount the sample below the drive shaft, then you can raise uh, the fluid bath to submerge the sample. But still, three-point bending is kind of hard, but you can try uh, dual cantilever bending or single cantilever bending to test the modulus because uh, when once the sample is submerged in the liquid, um, it's becoming softer, um, and we do need some support, uh, like from the clamps, to hold the sample. Uh, because the three-point bending is going to, it doesn't have any uh, support from the clamps, it's going to sag in the middle. So we recommend uh, uh, dual cantilever or single single cantilever bending um, to run the fluid bath uh, setup anyway. Okay, thanks for that. This question comes from Evan, who wants to know, is there a way to validate the TTS model? Uh, yes. I mean, um, before the TTS the model is available, um, uh, people use creep um, because that's, that, that can be considered a very low frequency test, right? Uh, you can change the um, uh, add load, remove load, add load, do many cycles. That's a very um, uh, low frequency um, test. You can add that point to your curve um, to see how it um, compares to the TTS modeling. Uh, for high frequency, uh, there there are some techniques. Like I mentioned, it's uh, like, a, a, for example, free resonance uh, test uh, or impact tester, uh, like a drop test. You can use those to test the sample and compare that with the TTS model. Okay, thank you. This question comes from Diane, who asks, is it possible to compare TG measured by DMA and DSC? Well, generally speaking, it's impossible 
uh, because they are really uh, because DMA and DSC they are really marrying different properties, and I have seen data everywhere. I mean, for the same sample, uh, some polymers uh, DSC TGA TG is lower, um, DMA TG is higher. Some polymers just the other way around. So in order to co really compare your sample, you probably have to run a standard on both instruments, uh, then build a correlation or calibration curve. Say if uh, your standard material uh, has a 10 degree difference between the two instruments, then you use that to correct for your um, for your answer on the DMA, or you know, and then you can have this correlation that you can really compare. Um, without that, I mean, sometimes you don't have a DSC to cross-check or confirm your results uh, or, or the other way around. I mean, it's still a good tool because you can uh, set up the same, uh, use the same geometry, same testing conditions to run, the, run them on the DMA and compare uh, samples, uh, the results generated from the same uh, instrument. Um, I mean, it, you don't really need to uh, compare the TG between instruments because everybody knows that's uh, not possible. But uh, still, if you really want to, you have to use a standard. Okay, thanks for that. We uh, keep your questions coming. If we don't have time for them, we will get you a written response afterward. This one comes from Ricardo who wants to know, is there a way to measure the toughness at high velocities like impact strength using high frequencies? Yeah, I mean the DMA, like you mentioned in there earlier, the DMA has uh, has a limit on high frequency, um, a few hundred hertz to a thousand hertz. Um, that's that's about it. Um, if you really want to um, uh, study the high frequency behavior, you probably want to use a TTS model if it's valid. Mm -hmm. um, otherwise, it's not uh, possible to test really high frequency. Uh, with a with a normal with a standard DMA. And time for one last question. This one comes from Hermes, who wants to know, with which method do you determine? I'm sorry. How do I define when to use single cantilever over dual cantilever? Well, they they both work fine. Um, a couple of, uh, things. If you have a long, if you have a short sample, obviously. Um, you want to use a single cantilever um, because you know, dual cantilever requires a longer sample. Uh, but sometimes, uh, but the other situation is your sample retracts, shrinks. Then you want to use a dual cantilever bending because with a single cantilever bending, your, your sample shrinks. It's going to pull the drive shaft off from the center towards the fixed clamp. So that is going to give you a lot of uh, errors in the measurement. And then uh, we had one last question come in. We'll try and get to it. With which method do you determine the linear viscoelastic region of a polymer with the DMA-8000? Well, we just uh, have to use another static method with the DMA. Um, cause, like I mentioned, there's a lot of, there are many static methods you can use on the DMA-8000. One of them is the stress strain curve. You can, you can still do the, uh, strain scan or, stat or stress scan uh, without any oscillating uh, force, then you can look at the displacement or strain uh, plotted against the stress or stress placing. You, you, so, meaning, you know, in short, that, that you can still do uh, stress strain and build that stress strain curve with the DMA 8000. Well, that's all the time we have for questions today. I want to thank you, Jun uh, Wang. Plastics Today appreciates your time and expertise on today's topic. And thank you to our sponsor, Perkin Elmer, as well as to everyone in the audience. We appreciate your attention and participation. Within the next 24 hours, you'll receive a personalized follow-up email with details and a link to today's presentation on demand. Please feel free to invite your colleagues and peers who may not have been able to listen to the event today. This webinar is copyright 2020 by Informa. Presentation materials are owned by or copyrighted by Plastics Today and Perkin Elmer. The individual speaker is solely responsible for his content and his opinions. On behalf of our guest, June Wong, I'm Michael Krieger. Thanks for your time and have a great day. Thank you.